Hello, and welcome to another episode of Inspire Higher Bible Study, where we seek to have a higher walk with Christ and love Him more and be just better Christians, better people, and a better asset to the church and the world as we grow higher with God. My name is Leo, and I'm here to be your moderator, your teacher, if you will, and hopefully we can both learn as we go and a little bit deeper in God's Word, finding some jewels that maybe we haven't mined for before. But before we do anything else, we want to always start with a word of prayer and ask God to be present. So please join me. Lord, we thank you for this Bible study time you've given us. Lord, we ask that you would anoint everything that is said, take my countenance, take my words and my thoughts, and use them to take us all deeper in your word and higher in your will so that we can be instruments of you in this world. And if you do these things for us, continue to bless us and dwell with us. We'll be ever so careful to give your name the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as you can see from our topic tonight, our, our title here on the screen, we're talking about the blessing of community. And um, this teaching was adapted from a series we, we've done here in, um, in called the Disciple Path Series. Very good um, set of books that we got from Lifeway. I don't, I'm not receiving any endorsements from them, so I'm not you know, getting paid to tell you that. But it was a very good study, and I, if you want, that was a great, great for like a small group or a, a church to go through. It's really deep. But we want to talk about the blessings of community because being a part of a church is is so much more than sometimes culturally we appreciate it to be. And in these times that we live in right now where we can't physically be together, this is a, a great time for us to really discover what it means to be a community, to be a body of believers, to be that group that fellowships and loves the way God intended us. And hopefully when God moves and everything is better and we can get back to meeting the way we're traditionally accustomed to, that we can go back with deeper strength, with deeper bonds and deeper love because we understand that we're a part of a community and how we should function in that community. So we're going to go ahead and dive in to the blessing of community. Now, you probably recognize this, this scene, and if you don't, I'll give you a little history. This is from the movie Castaway, and that's Tom Hanks, one of the greatest actors. Um, and here in the plot of the story, he's um, lost at sea, ends up on this deserted island that's uncharted. He's there for four years. And one day a beach ball or a volleyball washes up on the shore. And because he's there alone, he, be, he names this ball Wilson. And that's the brand of it. But he calls it Wilson and draws a face on it. And as you can see, even gave it some hair there. And it becomes his companion. He begins to talk with it. It, goes, it travels around the island with him. He discusses the shit, decisions with it. He even gets in arguments with it, as you can see here. But when you look at the premise of why that was, he needed somebody. He needed another being. He needed another entity to give back to him. And even though Wilson couldn't give back to him, it gave him some sense of community as he was there by himself. At the end of the movie, when he's on the raft and, and he's built his raft and he's getting off the island, Wilson is lost at sea and he weeps uncontrollably because he's lost what has become his best friend. And it shows that we as humans are wired to be together. We're wired to support and need others. So we want to make sure that um, as we look in this, that we always remember that this is who we're meant to be. So we're talking about getting back or growing into what we're supposed to be, not something that we're not designed for. So we're going to continue here. And now a perfect example of the ideal community in the church is can be found in the book of Acts, chapter 2, beginning at verse 42. And we're going to read here, apologize, I apologize for my reading, but we want to share in the scriptures here. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common. And, and they sold their possessions and good and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and the breaking of bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were saved. Here we see as the um, day of Pentecost has happened and the message is going forth and thousands of people are joining the church and they begin to bring about a revolution, if you will, in Jerusalem. And not just because of the word that was going forth and the doctrine that was being preached, that was the foundation of it, but it's what that doctrine gave rise to among those that began to held, hold these beliefs 
as their own. The community coalesced around the doctrine of Jesus Christ and what he taught, what he taught them to be and what he was calling them to be. And out of that grew this movement of love and mutual support and this ethic of friendship and mutuality that began to take its own, become its own vibrant organism in the city. People began to want to be a part of this brand new community that was living in a way that hadn't really been the norm for them. You know, I like the part where it said that they continued daily on one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house. See, one of the things that we're going to talk about later is sometimes we restrict everything to the church. But here we see they were going to the temple together and studying God's word and worshiping together. But they were also doing things out in the community from house to house. They were having small group, if you will. They were going out to dinner together. They were um, mingling and intermingling and fellowshipping wherever they met. And people that weren't a part of the community began to experience their interactions and, and observe them. And it made them want it. And when that kind of community existed in the church, what you saw is to the church, daily souls were being added to the church. And they were being saved because they were being drawn in like a like insects to a flame. They were being drawn in by that love and that fellowship and that community that had grown around the doctrine of Jesus Christ. And that is the sense of community. That is the blessing of community that we hope that we can build upon, that we hope we can enhance, not coming out of this isolated time that we're in so that the church can be even more powerful, more effective for those that are already in the community and for those that need a community to be a part of. So this is typically what we see as church. We think about the building or the temple as we talked about in that scripture. We think about the worship services or the Bible studies or the, the youth night or whatever it may be. And those things are good. But a lot of times, if we restrict church to these things, we begin to miss that deeper sense of community because when we leave here, what happens? Because the community has to last longer than the church service. Because if it's not, if it doesn't, then it's not really a community. It's just a social club. We meet, we go home. But church, the, that text portrays church like this. It's a group of believers who hold Jesus Christ's teachings and doctrine to close to heart and begin to act them out in service one to another. Here we see they're putting food together and they're building things together. And that's what the church is supposed to be, that I'm supporting you, you support me. And together we can impact the world through Jesus's will in a mighty and special way. This is what the church portrays us to be more than just the Sunday morning services or whatever structured um, gatherings we have. But it's a sense of community where we're all supporting and loving and fellowshipping with one another as we act out the words that Jesus left for us. When he came. Now, you all have you ever heard anyone say, "Oh, I don't do church." You try to invite them, or you talk to them about um, about Christ, and they say, "Oh, well, I tried. I don't really do the church thing." And sometimes that statement takes on a life of its own because sometimes we can all get caught up just doing church versus being the church. But what does doing church often look like? We attend the worship services. We go to the church for the services when it's open. We sing along when it's time for worship. We, you know, of course we know what the buildings are or they're building a new gym or they're building a new youth center. And a lot of times we just do that. We keep our membership active. We go, we do those activities and we leave. And now in, in and of themselves, none of these activities are good. And actually they are very significant. Even in the early church, we saw them going to the temple. They were going to their services. They were going to their teachings. They were learning the doctrine. So that is in and of itself not a bad thing, and it's actually a needed. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. So this is needed, but when we just do these things, when we just do church, then it becomes very superficial and hollow if we are not very mindful and prayerful to actually be the church. And what does it look like when we are trying to be the church? When we're striving to act out those words in our everyday interactions and really build the community. Well, we have an unabashed support through ups and downs. And that word unabashed means I'm not shamed to share with you my ups and my downs. Have you ever been in a situation where something's going on in your life that's not great that you want to share, but you feel kind of restricted or you feel hesitant to share it with those you worship with because you feel it may affect how they view you? It may affect your standing in the congregation. They may look at you and say, you shouldn't struggle with those things. 
Well, if we have this community of believers where we all recognize who Jesus was and what his message was, then there's this openness and this reciprocity that we can support each other, whether it's good times or whether it's times that we're struggling. That we don't have to be ashamed to share the, the hard things in our life because we know when we go to those in our community, even though they may, they may look at it and they may recognize it as a negative for us, we recognize that they're going to try to help that they're going to pour into us and help encourage us and bring us through that, that hard or that dark time and not simply cast us away because we're in there. We have to, that is what happens when we are beginning to be the church. Also, you have tangible support of one another that is freely given to meet one another's needs. That means there are actual actions and deeds that you can see and appreciate in the physical where someone is reaching out to help you when you need that they're doing it freely and with joy and with happiness and with love to meet the needs that you have. That is that room we talked about in that scripture in Acts 2, that they had all things as common. Now, I don't expect you to sell your house to give one, to buy one for someone else, unless God calls you to do it. I'm not saying that's what we have to do, but that emotional tie to where I'm willing to, to freely give to another brother or sister in Christ to help them when they need, to be there for support in a physical, tangible, readily appreciated way. Remember, love is an action word, so it should drive us to actions, and that's where it's tangibly meeting each other's needs. We should always be equipping and encouraging each other. The church should be a place where people are pouring into you to help you grow as a person, to help you grow in your spiritual walk, to help you grow in your career, your finances. We should be equipping each other, sharing everything that God has given us because we know he's not giving it just to us. He wants to get it through us. He wants to help us do things with those gifts that he brought to the church. Um, we should always be encouraging each other. If you can never go anywhere else to be encouraged, you should always know that if I get to one of my brothers and sisters in Christ, they will encourage me in this situation. They will lift me up in my spirit. That is where it sets us apart. You know, we often hear that we are a peculiar people in the church. It's not just peculiar in the way we dress or what we don't do, but we're peculiar in how we relate to one another, that we're always looking for the positive. We're always trying to uplift everybody else around us because that's what Jesus did for us. If we're followers of Christ, we should emulate his, his, his mission. And his mission was to lift everyone he came around. So we should always be encouraging each other. And finally, expressions of sacrificial giving. Giving when it's not convenient. Sometimes you're going to be called on to go to the hospital to see somebody or to go over to someone's house to help them with something or to talk to them on the phone when they're going through. And you may really have something else that you could be doing. But would you sacrifice that time because it's good for your brother or sister in Christ? When that's sacrificial, even if it's not money, if it's just time, a listening ear, intercessory prayer, making time to pray for them and genuinely praying for their well-being and their uplifting, then that sacrifice, and when it's shed abroad through that community of the church, begins to be, be, have a groundswell of love, a groundswell that blossoms and begins to be a beautiful expression of what Jesus intended his church to be. So we don't want to just do church. We want to be the church. Doing church is good. But it's hollow if we're not being the church as well. So what limits our community? Somebody may be asking, well, why are, why are churches not doing this? What makes this so difficult? Well, as I was studying and, and kind of contemplating on this, I was led to um, an author by the name of Matt Skinner. And he had this quote that I really liked. He said, the snapshot of communal life in Acts 2.42 does not occur separately from the Spirit's prophetic work. For it exists as a constituent piece of the Spirit's witness. And I love that part, that if we are called, the Holy Spirit is the thing that calls us to Jesus. It calls us unto repentance. So the Holy Spirit's called us to join the church. If we have felt the tug of Jesus Christ in our life, then the Holy Spirit's called us to that community. But it didn't just call us to salvation. It didn't just call us to a list of doctrine. It called us to this communal, sacrificial, love, overflowing state of existence that should exist in the church. The Spirit calls us to this work and empowers us for the work of building community in the church. God calls people to salvation through the Spirit and creates community comprising those who are called. But this last sentence that I highlighted is really where the limit of the church can be found or the limit for the community of the church. We long for life-affirming benefits that community can bestow, but we resist the demands 
that community makes. And that is so true. And I'm guilty of it as well. We all know that having a great support system is a must. We all know that it is so valuable to have someone that you can call on when you need them and they're going to show up. That's the benefit of a life-giving, a community of believers that are acting out God's word. But then, if we're in that community and we're receiving those benefits, at some point in time, we're going to be called on to meet those, to meet those needs of others and to be reciprocal in that given. We resist the demands that the community makes. Receiving is one thing. We love that support system, but then we don't, it's not always comfortable when now it's time for us to meet the needs. It's time for our, our sacrifice to be given. It's time for our inconvenience to be the act of love we show for another. That is what limits community. We can't always want for ourselves. We have to be very comfortable. We have to be very genuine and with, through the spirit, very motivated to give and to do and to love others. That is where the community of the church of Christ's church is set apart from other places and from other entities is that that the love that Jesus imparts to us through his sacrifice and through the Holy Spirit calling us to repentance and empowering us to live this life that is where we begin to see that we are motivated we're called we're excited to share in meeting the demands and the needs of others so this is what limits community but we don't want to have that limit placed through us also, in Philippians 2, verse 3 and 4, it says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. Now, this is a big one. Because we as humans love to bring drama because we don't think we're getting what we're supposed to have. That somebody's not respecting or appreciating me the way they should. That I'm not getting the credit I deserve. That's strife and vainglory. This, the, and the Bible says, let nothing be done through strife and vainglory. So we have to love each other enough that I'm not going to cause drama just because I, I, I perceive an offense. Even when there's really none there. I perceive an offense because somebody didn't respect me. They didn't, they didn't give me the credit I was due. I want that empty glory that, that I desire. They said, let nothing be done. But in lowliness of mind, as in humility, let each esteem others better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. This is where that community of Jesus' church is born, is when we begin to consider others and their needs as well as and before ours. When we begin to care just as much about the welfare of our brother and sister in Christ as we do about our own, that we can sacrificially give of ourselves for the good of someone else and not seek it or need it in return, then we begin to see that community grow and that community begin to be stitched together with the binds of love and now it can blossom and be everything God called us to be. Now, we need community, especially Christ's community. We are designed to live together, not just in proximity, not just sit in the same pew or attend the same small group, but to be mutually bonded at the roots of our heart. That our love for each other is bonded together through Jesus Christ. That we seek and support and sustain one another. In the absence of this um, love and support, this is where all of our flaws begin to become our driving force. All of the things that are wrong begin to be the things that are ever-present and begin to be our motivating factors. Selfishness, self-centeredness, even in the smallest degree, begins to fray the community of the church. This is the source of the rampant societal ills that we see, that I want my way versus the other person's way, that I want my comfort versus the other person's comfort. Well, the church has to be different. Again, if we're going to truly be peculiar, not just in how we dress and what we do, but we have to be peculiar in how we love, how we consider others. And this is the blessing of the community of the church. Because when this community exists, it blesses all that come in contact with it. And that's exactly how the church grew in those early days. Is because those who were apart were blessed and joyful and excited because they were apart. And those who weren't sought to be included because it was not normal for them to see those things. But we have to combat and pray that we don't have selfish and vain desires. That we can really consider the well-being of others just as well and even more than our own. Since ancient times, philosophers, Plato, Marcus Aurelius, all of these, you know, Aristotle, they all 
wrote so beautifully and eloquently about what society would look like if everybody held the ideals of supporting and being friendly and this ethic of friendship and mutuality existed all throughout society. They had these high, lofty ideals of the perfect society with ethics of friendship and mutuality. Well, they were describing the early church. That's what they were striving to get. But only through Jesus' sacrifice and the work of the Holy Spirit can we get there. But we have to give it a free course and embrace what it asks us to do so that we can do that. The church should strive to be this way. Now, will we ever truly, fully see this in our time, consistently, forever? No, because we're people. We're air. We're flawed. We air every day. Even in the Bible, in Acts chapter 2, we saw the ideal, perfectly functioning church. In Acts chapter 5, we see a couple begin to be selfish and withhold some of their resources from the church and not have everything in common. And that's where you see the church start to fray. And you go through the New Testament and you see instance after instance where there's scripture addressing issue in a church. But that first iteration of the church is what we should strive for. We should press toward the mark. We should always try to and ask God, give me the love that I need to be a, a productive member of the community of your church. We should strive to this end because we see its effects on souls, both in the church and those that experience this radical, mutual, spiritual-filled love outside the church. If we truly want to draw people and attract them to the church, this community has to exist before they come in contact with us. If they see this type of love, if the world sees this type of abnormal, self-sacrificing, spirit-empowered love that is dedicated to the mission of Jesus Christ, then they want a part of that. Even if they don't tell you, even if they don't say it and they may not recognize it, they want, we all seek to have that type of relationship because it's who God called us to be. In John 13, chapter, I mean, verse 34, it said, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this will they know you that you are my disciples if you have love one for another. This is how they recognize us. Not because of what we wear only. Not because of what we say. Not because of a cross on our neck or a Bible under our arm or they see us going and coming from the church. They may recognize that we're a church member. But if they see this love, this, this God-motivated, Jesus-enabled, Holy Spirit-empowered love functioning among our community of, of the church, that is when they know that we are his disciples because they experience that love and they witness it at work in our life. This is the blessing of community. And we should all strive. I pray every day that God helps me to be a member of this community, a productive member that I add more than I, uh, I, re I require because I want to be a source of God's work in the church and in the world. So I hope you've enjoyed. I hope you've been inspired to, to, be a, to, to pray that our, your church community grows stronger, that you as a member of that community grow stronger, and that we can move away from doing church alone to be in church, both in the building and when we're separate. Because right now, we're forced to be separate because of what's going on in our land. But if we come back, when God makes it possible for us to come back together, and we come back with the spirit-filled, God-motivated, mission-oriented love, then the church can have a revival and a renewing and impact the world around us in ways that many of us have never seen. I hope you've been blessed. And I hope you've learned something. And as always, if I skipped something, if I missed something, if I misspoke, please feel free to let me know. And also, if you have questions, please feel free to comment. I thank you for joining us again here on Inspire Higher. And let's all pray that we can have the blessings of community that Christ is talking about and seeking in his church. Thank you, and we'll see you again.